Bueno, así cogará, ¿vai? En matendo ya, gustia chincho chincho vuelta tu saretela. Jarra e, du, bere bigarren parte a Ari Kingo Diego, ¿vale? On, but we, okay. 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 Let's uh, let's continue. So, the way I thought we continue is, uh, I thought I'd finish. Uh, explaining the model and, and all those dimensions, and then maybe we take a break for your questions and for your hopefully very critical questions before we then look at material and very practical ideas that we have uh, provided, that we have already published, uh, to show how these things can be implemented. And before that, I'm also quite proud uh, to say that we now have the first two PhD theses uh, completed and the research completed, and that we can actually show that this attempt at getting kids to process things at a deeper level actually pays off. And that we have, we seem to be confident to say that we have found ways of actually promoting uh, subject specific language skills and understanding in students. So based on everything we said so far, uh, here's our original model, which is Part one. So we do believe that in order to really learn things at a deep level, students basically need to do one thing, even though it's very complex. So they need to connect the thinking and the speaking. And it's actually uh, this bridging when learners connect the subject contents and their specific skills, and if they're able to talk about these things, that we see deeper learning happen. And that goes for all the four dimensions of subject learning or any kind of learning that we talked about earlier. So it's, it would be wrong or it would be misunderstanding our ideas uh, to say they're just about language. That, that's not it, okay? Language is really important, but the doing is as important as the communicating and the reflecting. That's why we followed this Australian approach and we picked up these four dimensions because for teachers, it's really easy to say, well, there's four dimensions. It's the doing, the organizing, the explaining, and the arguing that we need to focus on. Also, if that is actually true, if these domains are similar across subjects, then it's also a great way of mapping progressions in different curricula. So our job then as teachers is simple. It's take the potential of our learners, the meaning making potential that we see in this blue circle or sphere and make and extend it. So help our kids understand things at a deeper level and the way they understand things at a deeper level is by giving them opportunities to do things in subject specific ways and communicate and reflect on that understanding in appropriate subject specific ways. This is how we envision progression. This is what we believe is deeper learning. However, after we had completed this in 2015, we realized that this was just the beginning of a journey and not the end. Because we felt quite confident that we had tackled the idea of what it means to deeper learn, but what we had not talked about at all is the learner, our children themselves. And uh, in another project, we were uh, developing a huge interest in engagement in what it takes for learners to become engaged. And what we learned from uh, the review of that research is that engagement is the key to learning. So we need 
our learners to be engaged. And the difficult thing about engagement is that engagement is now considered to be a multidimensional construct. Uh, so engagement actually is not only cognitive, but it is also emotional and it's behavioral. And where this gets tricky is that they influence each other. So what that means is that a child who does not feel well at school, who does not feel respected, who does, is maybe hungry or doesn't feel safe, will not be able to engage in the same way on a cognitive level as a child who does. So if we can't provide an atmosphere where kids feel safe and where they can engage on an emotional level with the topic and with us, they won't learn the same way. And of course, if they're not engaged emotionally and cognitively, it will not translate into a specific kind of behavior. And what that means is, it doesn't matter how much we know about deeper learning and how good we are at breaking things down if we don't at the same time include the learners and make sure that we keep engagement high. And that is something that I think we don't do enough. Okay, we're still too focused on the learning instead of focusing on the learner. Okay, we're much more focused on where we want to go than on making sure that we don't lose our children along the way. And that is very problematic, and these are things I learned from working with psychologists, is engagement affects everything else. So if a child does not engage, if he feels that he or she cannot master a task because it's obviously too difficult, why should they care? If we feel that something is way too difficult for us and we have no chance at succeeding, we usually don't put in any effort. And if they reflect on this, and that's what kids do all the time, did I do well, what about others, what, how do they see me and, and who am I? And if they have these experience, if they experience failure all the time, it will in turn affect their sense of self-efficacy. Because put quite simply, they will think of themselves as losers. And if they're losers, and if they're convinced to be losers, why should they engage? And what that means is that there's no way we can talk about deeper learning if we neglect this dimension. And the reason why we put so much effort uh, or why so, so much emphasis on this is based on Carol Dweck's uh, research on growth mindsets. And she basically says, we need to rethink how we see intelligence, how we see talents, because there's growing evidence that if a child believes that he or she is capable of making progress, and if they put in enough work, it's not about them feeling good, but in them believing that if they put in the work, if they put in the effort, uh, and, 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 and do all the uh, tasks and the repetitions and the practice and everything, then they can grow, then this will affect, affect their performance. Whereas children who have a fixed mindset, who believe that they're bad at certain subjects, and we're really good in our system to transport these messages, like girls are bad at math, they're bad at science, if we start believing in this, or boys are not as talented when it comes to languages, when we start to believe in them, uh, these things, they will become self-fulfilling prophecies. And I have learned, I think, most about these things from a book on teaching maths. I'm not a math expert, but this book by Joe Bowler, which is called Mathematical Mindsets, has taught us so many things. And this is an image that she presents in her book saying, you know, this is what happens in the brain of a student with a growth mindset 
when he or she is making a mistake. And what happens is that this brain lights up, which means it's learning. Whereas in a student with a fixed mindset, when he makes a mistake, nothing happens. Because for them, mis mistakes are not an opportunity. And one of the most fascinating chapters of her book is when she talks about uh, the reasons why, th why she thinks that Asian students are, tend to be better at math than our students. And she says she spent quite some time in Asia looking at classroom and she said, and what they did, which something she never experienced in British or US classrooms is that by the end of the week, students would produce and present their mistake of the week. Okay, saying, look, this is my favorite mistake because this mistake helped me learn understand that and that. Or this is mine because I learned how to handle this problem through that mistake. And I don't think we do that at school. I don't think, honestly, I don't think we really consider mistakes to be some, as an opportunity to learn. And in some countries, we even have a way of counting mistakes in language classes, saying, you know, in your essays or in your article, you made 17 grammar mistakes. And that's why it's an F. Okay, but what that will do is turn that person's mindset into a fixed mindset, saying, I'm bad at writing languages. And it's, in, when it comes to languages, this is even more absurd, because if you look at the documents from the, the people who wrote the, uh, the framework, there is amazing documentation that mistakes are normal at every level of language learning. So this is just typical, and they can even map the certain mistakes that students make at certain levels. It's normal. The only people who seem to have a problem with that is us teachers. And when you really think about this, this is weird, okay? Because we should know better. Anyway, so this is research that Tweck and others have published. This is rather new. I think it's from 2017, and it's really, really mind-boggling because they had access to all the student data of Chile. And what they compared is performance in the final tests in both languages and math. And what they did is map progress and achievement in relation to family income and uh, achievement and mindset. So. Those students on the dotted line, those are those students with a growth mindset, and the others are those with a fixed mindset. And what you can see is how impactful mindset seems to be on performance at every level. It even seems to indicate that if we work on our students' mindset, that seems to be a way of fighting social inequalities if that is what we want. Because what you see here is that students from the lowest income families in both math and languages with the right mindset do much better than kids from the richest families with a fixed mindset. This, why, this is why this is so important. And uh, Lentolf, I introduced uh, him uh, earlier, he says the same thing, he says, the way we can work on closing these inequalities or fighting inequalities is if we work on mindsets and if we help our students develop cognitive skills. And he says, showing them how to explain will teach them how to understand. And that is why he speaks of a linguistic imperative. He says, if we're serious about this, then we need to make sure that parents, teachers, and everybody else knows how to teach their children how to think. And the way we teach children how to think is by teaching them how to use the right kind of language. That's why this is so powerful. It's not just because if people use academic language, this is 
you know, sounds nice or it looks nice on paper. That's not it. It's because it's how we help them learn, how we help them build knowledge, and how we be help them become better at stuff. And where this becomes really, really mind-boggling is here, because uh, Joe Bowler, uh, no, that's uh, Carol Dweck, I'm sorry, she's really clear when she says, you know, we as teachers have the power to change our students' mindsets. We can affect the way our students think about themselves and how much effort they put in if we either encourage them or if we discourage them. It's our choice. And the way we do this is that way we structure and design our lessons. So are we really teaching for understanding? Do we provide feedbacks? And do we give them opportunities to revise? It's so important because that will help them develop the right mindsets. And that mindset is, I think, one of the main components which helps them succeed later once, they're, uh, once they quit school. But they need us teachers to do that. And unfortunately, and of course, since we're just human beings, we don't all have a growth mindset all the time, and we don't have uh, perfect skills. And as uh, I can show you in a minute, we make so many mistakes when it comes to feedback. And I'll just show you a short movie because I had to watch it several times to understand the implications of this. So this is the research that they did, and then we'll talk about the consequences. To solve. So you see these blocks? Can you tell me what color is on that side? Red, yellow, white, blue. All right, so what I want you to do is put these blocks together so that the picture on top matches the picture here, all right? First, we give children a set of easier puzzles to do. Now, here's the next one. When these nine and 10-year-olds successfully put together the puzzle, the children are praised for either their intelligence Wow, you did really well. You must be really smart at this. Or the effort they made. Wow, you did really well. You must have tried really hard at these. Then we give them a much harder set of problems, ones that they might, in fact, struggle with. Here's the next one. And we see what happens to their confidence. Do they think? Oh, this means I'm not good at it after all? Do they stop liking the puzzles? Or do they maintain their confidence and think, well, it just needs more effort or strategy? What happens to their motivation? You ready to go on? Ta-da! <laughs> we also ask them, well, what, which problems do you want to work on some more? Those easier ones or those harder ones? And generally, we find that, that kids who have been praised for their intelligence really want to go back to those easier ones that were their, kind of their claim to fame. Now, maybe we, we should repeat this, because this is really a bummer. Kids who were praised for their intelligence always tend to select easier exercises next. And what that means is, if we tell as teachers, if we say things, even though if we mean well, but if we give intelligence praise, thinking we are actually doing a good thing, we are actually limiting their learning. And that is something that, that really takes some time to understand. So if I tell a student, you're really good at this, you're really good at math, or you're really good at English, chances are that he will do anything in his power or her power to keep that label. So I want to keep being an A student. And if that means selecting easier tasks, or cheating, or whatever, then this is what students will do because they want to keep their label. 
And, and it's fascinating. If you, if you read uh, Carol Dweck's books, she keeps telling these stories and she said, you know, it took me quite a long time when I was sitting at airports and listening to parents and how many mistakes they made when they were praising their kids to just sit there and not try <laughs> to interrupt and say, wait a minute, what you do is wrong. You need to focus on effort, not so much as on intelligence. It just goes to show that what we do as teachers is a very, very demanding and complex job. And we cannot train enough for this because obviously there are things that we affect in our students without being aware of this. So we praise all the time but if we praise in the wrong way, we're doing more damage than we actually achieve. And what that means, and that's the problem, it's, it's far from, from easy, is if we're serious about deeper learning, we have to hold, look at the whole package. It's not just the, what the elements of knowledge. Is it factual information or conceptual or is it skills and how do we promote them? But it's also how do we interact with the students to make sure that we keep them engaged and to make sure that we don't limit their mindsets. So Again, according to Carol Dweck, these are the things that we can do. So we need to focus on understanding. And we use to promote effort. So she's very adamant. She says, it's not about making our kids feel good, but it's explaining, saying, and they have wonderful materials online which you can download for free, saying, you know, your brain is like a muscle. And if you want that muscle to grow, you need to train it. And that means that sometimes at school it needs to be challenging, it needs to be tough, but that's the way to grow. But I, as a teacher, will do whatever I can to help you master these things. And it's almost like this contract. I promise you that you're safe here and that you're in professional hands and that I help you grow. Okay, and this is why our model now has more dimensions. It actually has four. Because whatever I said before still holds true. It is about knowledge and the different aspects of knowledge, something that is very familiar to uh, almost every teacher because that goes back to Bloom and the taxonomy and the revised taxonomy. But at the same time, deeper learn uh, learning is the combination of understanding and communicating. So it's about how we communicate with people for different purposes, using different text types, different modes, digital, analog, maps, drawings, and so on, and using both colloquial and academic register. At the same time, we need to make sure that we keep the learner engaged. That's why this is so fundamental. So we need to make sure that we generate and sustain commitment and achievement, make sure they feel well and safe, most importantly, that we keep engagement high, that we show them that they can master the tasks at their level, if it needs be, and give them ways to reflect on their learning because this kind of reflection in combination with revision and so on is where we learn. And it needs us, and I think it needs teachers more than ever, who are professional and trained to create these kind of learning environments. So, and we do this by designing or planning our lessons by the way we help and support our students through all kinds of scaffolding, the way we provide feedback, and also, at least as important, the way we assess. 
that's our model in a nutshell. And before we, uh, before I'd like to give you opportunities to criticize this and come up with all sorts of feedback, I actually do think that we are facing a really critical choice and it's like this, okay? It's, it's honestly, it's what is it that we want to provide for our children? And most teachers I talk to, they agree. They say, you know, we, there's no discussing or debating that we should focus on quality. But sometimes it's the way systems are structured, curricula are written or are interpreted that teachers feel they have to rush through all this. Or that they feel, I totally agree and I'd like to teach that way because I feel this is what, this is why I became a teacher, but I'm not allowed to do that. People want me to serve hamburgers when I'd rather provide them with a healthy salad or whatever. And what it does mean, and I found that on Twitter, is we just need to have the courage to slow things down. Because it's, it's, I honestly think the, w the way to speed up learning is by slowing it down. Okay, that's a first attempt to describe the model. Okay, and I'm, I know it's, it's probably a lot to take in. It, you, it took us years to understand it. So I'd be very surprised if you could just say, okay, let's move on, okay? So if you have questions, criticism, please ask, and then we can uh, show you, I can show you materials and show you how to plan for these things because that's what I actually do for a living. So our master's students have to learn how to plan lessons and materials that way. And most of the time in our seminars, we focus on teaching English as a foreign language. And since we're not happy with the way that most textbooks are designed at the moment, uh, it is their task to create digital textbooks, which we then use on iPads, because they offer so much more than what traditional textbooks uh, can do at the moment. So maybe just a, a few moments to take a breath and then fire away with your questions and hopefully I can handle them. <laughs>